नमस्कार वेलकम टू दिस एडिशन ऑफ द इंडिया फाउंडेशन पॉडकास्ट कॉल्ड इंडिया फर्स्ट इन दिस एडिशन ऑफ द इंडिया फर्स्ट पॉडकास्ट वी हैव विद अस वाइस एडमिरल शेखर सिन्हा फॉर्मर कमांडर इन चीफ वेस्टर्न नेवल कमांड एंड फॉर्मर चीफ ऑफ इंटीग्रेटेड डिफेंस स्टाफ एम्बेसडर अनिल त्रिगुनायक डिस्टिंग्विश्ड फेलो एट विवेकानंद इंटरनेशनल फाउंडेशन एंड फॉर्मर इंडियन एम्बेसडर टू जॉर्डन लीबिया एंड माल्टा दे आर इन कॉन्वर्जेशन विद मेजर जनरल ध्रुव कटोच डायरेक्टर इंडिया फाउंडेशन The theme of the podcast is future of the cod implications in the region. Let's begin. Namaskar. The cod summit held virtually on 12th of March and the joint statement issued thereafter marks a significant milestone in the evolution of the group A. In the White House press conference held shortly after the summit each of the four leaders had described the meeting as historic clearly the quad has acquired considerable momentum and is here to stay president joe biden has endorsed the free and open indo pacific nomenclature used by his predecessor donald trump and towards that end apprehensions that the us would seek to adopt a softer line towards china and that the salience of the indo pacific would therefore correspondingly reduce stands negated on the contrary the us national security adviser jake sullivan has affirmed the centrality of the indo pacific in the us national security calculus and the quad uh, as a key component in that strategy in this session of india first we will discuss the future of the quad and the implication for the region with me to discuss the quad our vice admiral shaker sinha who is the former commander in chief of the western naval command and former chief of the integrated defense staff also with me in the discussion is shri anil trigunayat the former ambassador of india to jordan libya and malta a very warm welcome to both my guests let me be with you admiral sinha the joint statement which has been issued after the first virtual summit of the quad makes mention of the spirit of the quad how would you define this new spirit uh, thank you general katosh for getting me on this podcast uh, you know the uh, main part of this uh, question i would address in just one line that period of differing perceptions and visions of quad are over not only that these four countries know the rest of the world now knows that quad is there what are the visions and what are the agendas that it's going to follow and important in this is that the perceptions of all the four partners of the quad has been taken on board for example when you say for the sake of us and japan it refers to free and open indo pacific however if you see the next sentence in the next sentence it says immediately that free open inclusive healthy anchored by democratic values and unconstrained by coercion so this is meets the requirement of both australia and india because india always wanted to have it uh, inclusive and australia said that it doesn't not going to bend to the coercion so those two components having been included this is a very beautifully crafted sort of uh, uh, vision statement which has been made and you mentioned a very uh, very important point is why is being called the uh, spirit of the quad you know it is inspired really uh, by the title uh, the of the joint statement because the joint statement says this and therefore you will find that uh, the rest of the text is actually inspiration from the title so the title has been so chosen that every word of this have, must have a meaning and a follow out in the following paragraphs so uh, it's a giant leap uh, forward uh, and now the time has ba- you know tom is uh, back uh, political commitments uh, with a uh, very strong uh, set of rules and state the stakeholders have got uh, they can use their fresh ideas three working groups you know energy uh, then you have got uh, fresh ideas then you got stamina all this is going to factor into this so that is why when uh, when they say that is the spirit of the quad uh, to my mind this is what it means Oh, thank you, Admiral. I think that has been put very, very nicely. And now moving ahead, the Quad nations have advocated for a free, open, and inclusive Indo-Pacific, and committed themselves to a rules-based international order. How do you, Ambassador, 
see the rules being formulated? And more importantly, how do you see them being enforced? <clears throat> Thank you, General Sahib, uh, for having me on this uh, podcast. Uh, in fact, you know, as uh, Admiral Sinai has also mentioned, and you yourself mentioned, uh, this is a great achievement uh, because we were all thinking that the Quad has not even issued a joint statement when three times the foreign minister's meeting were going on. We heard of various uh, dissonance uh, of approaches uh, among all the four countries. In fact, it was seen that as if it was being driven only by the United States and the other countries were tagging along and were still trying to put their feet in both the uh, boats. So that has been uh, the case so far. But China has called upon itself, frankly. This kind of uh, uh, alacrity that has been uh, displayed in the hosting of the meeting of the Quad, which says two things. Number one is that President Biden considered that President Trump's policy as far as Quad and Indo-Pacific was concerned was worth continuing. And he has early on realized that uh, China is actually the main adversary for them. Even though now they have not one, but two, China and Russia both, they are playing on that. So in my view, how do they uh, bring about that is something, if you see this Quad Leaders joint statement, very interestingly, in at least in four paras out of the five, in the joint statement, there is a question, there are repeatedly references to free and open Indo-Pacific or inclusive somewhere, somewhere resilient, somewhere something. And the only para where it is not, that is about the, the vaccine. And the vaccine for what? For which Trump called as a China virus or some other. So that is also the origin there. So the whole, uh, Way, even though, except for South China, East China Sea, they had not mentioned that China is there. But China is everywhere present in every word of this particular statement, which was furthermore accentuated by the uh, a joint um, op-ed, which was brought out in Washington Post two days later by that. Now, in this statement, they have clearly said this is nobody wants to show it that it is an anti-China uh, exclusively, even though it is understood by the Chinese and the rest of the world and uh, the four countries themselves. Now, there are already the rules that have been framed for the free and Indo-Pacific, like the unclosed habit, the maritime laws are there. This is the global good. So the enforcement of it, how will it go? So today, what is happening is so far, China has been able to ingress uh, or have about 23 disputes, even though it has about 14, 15 uh, countries with whom it has borders, but it has problem with more than 24 countries. So therefore, now there is, we are seeing a greater collaboration and countries coming together from the position of the strength and clearly outlining that every step of the way, you will find that there is a questioning. There could be international organizations could be used for this matter. The China could be forced into it uh, to compliance. The basic idea is that China starts behaving like a normal nation. And that has been the basic thing. That is why the Biden's approach is slightly different than that of the Trump. So I think that when all these four largest democracies uh, bring about this kind of a, a maritime domain awareness and strength, the China will have to think twice before it gets into that kind of thing. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for getting in the Chinese angle. Now, uh, the common pillar of democracy, which you had mentioned, had earlier also brought about the idea of the formation of the Quad in 2007, when it was mooted by the then Japanese Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Shinzo Abe. Now for a decade or so, the Quad had limited traction and was described by the Chinese as sea foam in the Indian and Pacific Ocean. But Chinese transgressions in the Western Pacific Ocean seem to have added an impetus to the Quad since 2017 to counter a perceived Chinese challenge. How do you, Admiral Sena, see this panning out in the coming years? Well, uh, General, I think you always save the tough question for me. So let me try and be very <laughs> careful in answering. <laughs> the first point is that you are absolutely right. It is not only their transgression into Western Pacific, but the manner in which they occupied the islands in the South China Sea and disregarded the uh, UNCLOS. Uh, in all its uh, activity uh, that really alarmed the whole world, uh, not only ASEAN, but uh, the whole world. Uh, and I think the, uh, how is it going to pan out? I think more clarity will emerge 
after the meeting which is uh, happening today it will happen today in alaska between the top leaders of uh, uh, china and the us uh, but having said that the quad has already placed a premium on winning the hearts and minds of the people in the indo pacific so in this region i think the aim is to convince the uh, nations southeast asia pacific islands ior that quad is a very benign sort of uh, you know organization uh, and it is committed to the solutions for the development and will uh, will bring a little bit of stability in this area it explains the special sort of initiative to ensure equitable access to the covid vaccine uh, for every needy person in the region so that's a very laudable and doable proposition in the present scenario firm commitment from the us and japan to fund and logistics and some funding from australia and manufacturing and managerial skills of india they have all been put together so therefore i would think that it is going to pan out it will result in a sort of uh, very productive and uh, 1 billion vac vaccines have to be produced in by india by 2022 so all in all i think the uh, you know it is giving an alternate model right now if it can be done in vaccine or in other supply chain issues i am sure it can be done in many more fields which will emerge by the time the three working groups get on with their task all right uh, thank you for that um, uh, uh, for those inputs uh, now moving ahead further uh you spoke of the covid-19 pandemic so i'll i'll proceed from there itself now the pandemic has presented a common and big challenge as well as, a, as an opportunity to the world to collaborate on the larger human good uh the quad leaders made specific mention of collaboration to strengthen equitable vaccine access for all in the indo pacific region So, how do you, ambassadors, see the Quad cooperating in what can be termed as vaccine diplomacy? One, which has partially been covered by the admiral, as also taking it further forward in cooperating in the economic field. Well, uh, General Saab, the thing is that uh, Admiral Sinha has already touched upon, as you know, that with the Quad leaders' joint statement, there was also a fact sheet, in which we have seen uh, very rarely that is explained. exactly how things will proceed and they have been very clearly mentioned but i would like to go a step further i think that this is really a recognition of india's um uh, competency and the benevolence as far as the vaccine diplomacy is concerned even before the quad meeting we have already supplied vaccines to 72 countries and more to follow and they are from smaller countries the neighborhood Uh, the caricom countries and the isle pacific island countries so india has been doing its bit from bahrain to brazil to oman to all the countries in the world and it has started even in the early days when we were providing uh, the medicines to 150 countries now that is something the prime minister also has often said that it is vasudev kutumbakam in which we believe in it now the indo pacific of course we have close collaboration with the asean countries and we have been trying to assist wherever the need and we have already provided i think to thailand and some other countries myanmar we are uh, supplying the vaccines already despite their problems so india india is in this case is a country that carries forward the larger burden of the global goods and we insist on that and that's what the coming together of all these countries realizing india's potential and i believe that we have always talked about resilient value and global value supply chains so one of the fallouts in my view of the uh, pandemic has been that india has developed um, a pharmacy and vaccine supply reliable resilient global value supply chain which stands on its own now the other countries for for example johnson and johnson wants to build 1 billion uh, manufacture 1 billion vaccines in hyderabad they have already identified uh, a company there to do that bi and biotechnology and critical technologies and rare earths so we are collaborating across the board in the areas that are going to be far more important in the future and when we are looking at the ai driven industrial revolution 4.0 it is not to say that everything has been ironed out there are still a lot of problems at the bilateral level to do the trade and economic things but india stands way taller than all the other countries in the world as far as the vaccine diplomacy is concerned and the respect for india has tremendously grown up and i think the india will benefit a great deal 
uh, from this will be strengthened uh, its economic clout as well within the countries. All right, thank you for that. Now, um, you know, moving, uh, moving ahead, last year, when India and China were face to face in a warlike situation in the dark, India extended an invitation to Australia to join the Malabar naval exercise. Now, this move was seen as a result of the Indian pushback to China at its northern border. Now, naval cooperation amongst the four navies has been one of the most critical part in the quadrilateral groupings. How do you visualize, Admiral Sinha, the emergence of a security architecture around the quad grouping in the Indo-Pacific? Well, thank you for that question. Uh, General, if you had not asked me this question, I would have been a bit surprised. So that's a very good question. Uh, first thing is that uh, was invitation to Australia as a result of the pushback in uh, Ladakh. Uh, I would reserve my answer because this was already going to happen. It just so happened that the timings of Malabar, uh, you know, they were already fixed uh, quite you know way ahead in the in this in the year. Uh, but having said that, uh, the perceiving of that uh, thought. Uh, I think there's nothing wrong in that. You know, it, it gives you the legitimacy of inviting the uh, Australians to do this exercise. I want to draw the, you know, viewers' attention to, uh, you know, the statement which was made by Quad in a joint statement. We have, they have said that we will continue to prioritize the role of international law in maritime domain, particularly as reflected in the United Nations Convention on the Laws of the Sea and CLOS and facilitate collaboration, including maritime security, to meet challenges to the rule-based maritime order in the East and South China Seas. We reaffirm our so on. He goes on to North Korea. Now, what does it mean? That maritime security, they will cooperate. They will meet the challenges of rule-based order together. Now, the only uh, format which is available with the Quad countries the four navies, uh, which which form the part of Quad uh, of Malabar, belong to these four countries. So I think, therefore, there is a subtle sort of uh, indication that you don't worry about how do we ensure the maritime security. We already have an architecture. So I think that it's only a matter of uh, time that once the economic aspect and the trade aspect, vaccine aspect, the trade and the supply chain aspect gets covered. Malabar is already a worked up force, as you rightly said, the Navy is exercising earlier in the past also. But, uh, you know, using them to enforce the rule-based order, international law is here is very clearly defined that we will cooperate in maritime security to enforce the international, uh, you know, uh, UNCLOS, uh, you know, guidelines. So I think that there is, uh, I think it is said, but it is not said. I would, I would put it that way. So we have an architecture and we will enforce maritime. We will make sure that the maritime security and process follow to the end. So I think it's a great message here without actually saying it. Yeah, yes, I think you're right. There is a great message in it because without a certain element of deterrence, nothing will really work. Yeah. Now, a criticism has been leveled against India by some analysts who state that India's participation in the Quad violates its long-held tradition of maintaining its strategic autonomy. Now, uh, while India also participates in other similar groupings like BRICS, the RIC, and all that, why is India's participation in the Quad looked by these people uh, through an ideological uh, uh, underpinnings or through an ideological lens? Ambassador Trigunath. Well, as you know that... Uh... India has followed generally, and I would say that this is also in a way a policy of non-alignment. Uh, we have now moved from non-alignment, or you may expand it to consider as multi multiple alignments or the groups. It is that kind of, or convergences. I mean, we can put whatever thing. The most important thing in the underlying theme is that what is in your national interest? What is your national interest? What serves your national interest best? without being dictated by A power or B power. And that has been our major challenge all through how to maintain that since the independence. And now it is far more so when once again, we are in a similar kind of a Cold War 2.0 uh, kind of a situation. 
So many of the Chinese uh, experts have been talking about it, that India will lose its strategic autonomy. Uh, Global Times even wrote that uh, India's relevance in BRICS uh, will be no longer, or SEO is uh, uh, no longer uh, trustworthy or something like those kind of things. That is, I think we should not give any uh, credence to these kind of uh, uh, talking uh, done by uh, people who have a little understanding about actually the India's, uh, the way it is moving. Now, BRICS, as you know, or RIC for that matter, we have been the founding members of that. India is the chair this year of the BRICS. Our relationship with a country, we have many times repeated, does not, it, it may impact in, uh, at the end of the day, but it does not affect our relationship with another country. Of course, we have to create uh, uh, some kind of an equivalence because we have seen that what happened during the President Trump's time. It was my way or highway kind of his time when it was very, very difficult uh, for very often to you to take decisions. So therefore one bought the time. But in this squad basically is a natural thing. As far as India is concerned, India and Pacific has always been a natural uh, extension for us. And we do not think like the Americans or the Japanese or the Australians. We think of Indo-Pacific as a far bigger, far uh, much bigger than Eastern Africa or Western Asia, all these being part of that from our point of view. And they are very important. These sea lanes are very important for us. And we are not only talking to them, we are also talking to China, the, to Russia. Uh, for the corridor, I mean the, the Chennai and uh, Vladivostok corridor. We are talking, we are talking with trilateral with Japan now, Japan, Russia, and India. That will be very different. Russians, of course, don't buy the argument that uh, that this uh, quad is not against uh, China. But as you know, that if you have read uh, recently the comments after the quad uh, summit, China's comments have been quite muted actually after the summit because it was not directly marked. And it is also buying time and trying to improve relations with nearly all the countries, even though it's uh, wolf warrior diplomacy and bullying tactics are not going to go away. It is, it is a malign growth that will continue. From India's perspective, China would always be a major, major challenge. And in my view that we will have to deploy whatever resources, whatever diplomatic uh, channels available to us, we must do that. If it is caught, so be it. Oh yeah, I think that point is well taken. That China's um, uh, the China will remain a strategic challenge uh, as far as India is concerned. And the other aspect which you have brought up uh, brought out uh, very clearly is that uh, in the last few years we have seen India dehyphenating its uh, foreign policy. So our relationship with one country is not dependent on our relationship with the other. Now um, we've come to the end of uh, uh, end of the discussion phase. Can I have quick closing comments in about two minutes each by each of my two panelists, please? Uh, Admiral Sina, we'll start with you first. Well, I, I think that this is the best thing that could have happened in this, uh, uh, this time of the decade, uh, you know, right in the beginning, uh, because the aggressive and assertive approach of China was worrying everybody. And uh, now you have given space to smaller countries in ASEAN and the IOR and in the Pacific Islands, one team which can provide them all that they wanted, but they couldn't say because of the Chinese sort of, uh, you know, hold on the, these countries. So I'm sure that, you know, slowly the working groups will work and they will take these people on board. And they're all very benign sort of nomenclatures, if you like. They're not very aggressive uh, nomenclatures. If I find it cheaper, I find it better to buy a vaccine from India, be it. If it has got 87% success at breed, but it is a transparent method. The next thing that will probably happen is the infrastructure development in which these countries are going to invest, you know, India's engineering skills and infrastructure, Japan's infrastructure skills, money from US and maybe Australia. You know, you will find that these countries are going to get connected over a period of time. And it's not a short haul. You know, in general, it's a very long haul process because, you know, we are at a very turmoil of the whole geopolitics. It is either democracy stay or you get into other kind of governance system, which we are not used to, we will never be used to. They're too independent minded. So therefore, I think that it's on a very long haul and it was required, it is very timely. And you know, we, I don't think that you know, China is going to get away when 10, 15 countries jump on him and they tell him that this is not, this is not right that you're doing. I'm sure their own public opinion, they're very worried about their internal public opinion. If that happens, uh, then, you know, the Chinese government, the Communist Party of China will have to be very careful about what they're doing and what, 
how badly they have been sort of uh, identified with the Sabu. Right, thank you. Uh, Ambassador, let's <clears throat> have your closing comments, please. Well, I fully agree with what Edna Sina has said. Uh, the, now, as they said, that uh, taste of the pudding is in eating. Now we have these uh, three working groups that have been set up. Hopefully there will be some kind of a secretariat or a permanent working group overseeing this at the highest level uh, be there, where we will see the meeting of the uh, leaders once again, physically, probably at the G7 meeting uh, uh, next to the UK. Uh, so this is going to go forward. Now it will depend essentially on China, what kind of a quad it wants or what kind of relationship it wants. But at the same time, it will not be that easy because as the the tenor of the um, ASEAN centrality that we talked about in the statement is also born out of the fact that the ASEAN does not simply want to be a part of the security architecture. They want to see development. They don't want to annoy the Chinese, at least not now, not for now, even Vietnam, which is far more vocal about it. So we have to work together with those countries to see that where are the alliances, where are the uh, alignments with those countries are and where we can work together. So this will be an important thing. China will gear up. It's already doing it as far as vaccines are concerned in those countries. It's pumping in there um, and it will not let its uh, backyard go away easily in that sense because everybody is suffering. So from that point of view, now we'll see a more charged up uh, diplomatic uh, activities uh, and action across the board. All right, thank you. I think um, uh, it simply remains for me now to thank uh, both um, uh, the Admiral and the Ambassador for your very, very incisive comments. Uh, and uh, I think it has promoted a great deal of understanding um, to what the Quad is all about and what the future is likely to hold. Uh, this brings us to the end of the program. Uh, in conclusion, I will say Chinese belligerence and money power has created a great deal of unease in the Indo-Pacific regions, more so in the Western Pacific. The quadrilateral security dialogue, which was first conceived in 2007, has now, post the recent summit level virtual meeting, achieved a momentum which, in the coming years, will see the world's democracies cooperating with each other to keep the strategic and significant sea routes in the Indo-Pacific free and open in line with the secure and rules-based uh, rules global order. How predatory policies will be resisted will have to be seen as clearly brought out by uh, the panelists, but a significant milestone has been achieved in demonstrating the collective will of the world's democracies in preserving its core principles. We can expect more nations to support the aims and objectives of the Quad, both from the rim countries as also from Europe. Militarism, however, is very much is, uh, is very much in the air in the Indo-Pacific. So there would be a need to ensure that the levels of engagement are kept below the confrontational level and that the competition is non-militaristic. While development and diplomacy, as has clearly been brought out, will perhaps be the key instruments in play in preserving a rules-based order, an element of deterrence too would be required to ensure compliance. With this, I once again thank Admiral Sinha and Ambassador Trigunayat for the very, very valuable inputs in this program. Thank Namaskar. So Jai Bharat. Jai Hind. Thank you so much for listening to this edition of the India Foundation podcast. Do like, share and subscribe the India Foundation channel.